great day. Heaven and earth, and the world was born. Life begins and ends in the dust you form. Fate commanded. And the mountains move Fear is losing ground to our hope in you Unstoppable God, let your glory go on and on Impossible things in your name they shall be All our chains under Sin defeated Jesus is overcome Mercy triumphed When the third day dawned Darkness was denied When the storm was gone Unstoppable God Let your glory go on
Welcome to the service of worship. Uh, we are together and separate and still unified by the spirit of Christ and the body of Christ. Wherever you are right now, I want you to invite you. To, I want to invite you to find some way of passing the peace and greeting one, one another. If you're joining us on Facebook, put a comment in the in the. In, on, on Facebook, if you're joining us on YouTube, put a comment out there. Um, let's enter this time of worship together as the body of Christ as we 
invite the Holy Spirit to come and to sanctify the ground on which we sit, no matter where we are. Uh, would you join me in a word of prayer as we invite the Holy Spirit into this time of worship? Almighty Heavenly Father, thank you so much for another Sunday. Thank you for another day of bringing us back together. Thank you for your faithfulness to us wherever we are. Thank you for the, the, the distance that your word is reaching and for all of us who are gathered together as much as we can be across the various platforms that we are, we are connected on. God, I ask that right now your Holy Spirit would come and would touch the hearts of each of those listening to these words. I ask that your spirit would come and would calm us and would fill us and prepare us that the ground on which we stand might be holy ground and the space in which we sit might be our sanctuary and your spirit would come and draw our, our hearts closer to you again and again and again. This we pray in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Westminster. Uh, you know, this is a, an odd Sunday morning. We, we've been apart for so many time, so many weeks now, and I have seen a lot of you on Facebook and on social media and through email and through phone. We haven't actually seen each other in person for a while, uh, and so some of you might miss the fact that I am really pregnant right now. <laughs> like, 
really pregnant right now. So my due date's in a couple of days. Um, and I, you know, I've completed my transformation from giraffe into hippopotamus, which is about what happens as I go throughout this pregnancy journey. Um, and, you know, back at, at the beginning of pregnancy, there's this, this stage where no one can tell you're pregnant. They just think you're contagious because you're throwing up all the time. And then you enter this stage where people don't know whether to congratulate you or buy you a gym membership. <laughs> and then you get to the stage I'm at right now which is the stage where people get really nervous around you because they think you're about to have the baby at any moment. And I've been in that stage for a couple months now, and I'm definitely to the point, like, y'all, I'm in the stage of pregnancy where, uh, like, ice cream is a vegetable. Anything that falls on the ground is dead to me. And childbirth, frankly, doesn't sound so bad anymore. Like, <laughs> labor, you know not so bad as opposed to continuing on in pregnancy um, it, so I don't know if it is because of my condition uh, you know how you sometimes notice things in the Bible that you didn't notice before that's been happening to me a lot and it started happening uh, back when we were doing our John series I started noticing uh, things and then and then I just really went back and I was reading through sections of the Old Testament. And what I started noticing was the number of times in the way in which scriptures talk about childbirth and about uh, uh, women who are pregnant, about giving birth and labor and all of these things. And I just don't think I'd ever noticed it before because um, <laughs> it had never been quite so uh, on the top of my mind before. And it starts, so back in Genesis, you have... Um, when the world is created to be good and then when the world gets broken, the symbolic kind of breaking of the world are these curses that fall on different parts of, of creation of humanity. And the, the curse in humanity is divided into these two parts, one for the man, one for the woman. And at the time, it was, it was supposed to be a, a, a universal curse that would fall on all men, on all women. The men, the, 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 their work was cursed in that they were, had to try to feed their families from cursed soil that would no longer um, uh, uh, respond to them. And the women were cursed in that they would no longer bring forth children easily. They would bring them forth in pain. And that... Um, that image of childbirth as being uh, this sudden, painful, almost death experience is one that throughout the Old Testament, the writers bring up as this image. Um, and so they, they use throughout the Old Testament, you see, if prophets are trying to warn someone about the judgment of God coming quickly and painfully at a time they don't expect it. They say, it will come upon you like uh, labor pains come upon a woman. Um, there was one time there, an Old Testament writer was trying to give an example of something that was going to be a surprising judgment. He said, this will be as surprising as a man suddenly experiencing the pains of birth within him. Um, and, then, and then we see throughout... Obviously, there's also a positive image of motherhood throughout the Old Testament, but when it's talking about specifically um, the process of giving birth, overwhelmingly, it it's talks about the pain, about the suffering, about the, the turmoil. It's a symbol of God's judgment. It's a symbol of uh, suffering, which, honestly, historically speaking, is quite accurate because quite a lot of women die during childbirth, and so it's, it's not surprising at all. What caught my attention, and this is really where the sermon started germinating for me, what caught my attention was what happens in the New Testament when that same image comes up. And specifically what caught my attention, this was the first time I'd noticed this, there's a section in John 16 where Jesus actually uses this image. And I had never, I've read John a thousand times, I had never seen this before, before we did our deep dive of John, uh, probably because I'd never read it while being pregnant before. <laughs> but this is what it says. So this is John 16. This is at the very end of Jesus' earthly time. This is in his farewell narratives. He is about to go to the cross. He is giving instructions to his disciples. And what he tells them is basically, you are going to experience suffering in this lifetime, but take heart. And these are the words he uses. When a woman is in labor, 
she has grief because her hour has come. But when the child comes, she no longer remembers the anguish for the joy that a child is born into the world. You also will have sorrow now, but I will see you again and you will rejoice and no one will take away your joy. Now the reason that caught my attention is because he, he uses a bit of that Old Testament imagery, right? That childbirth is suffering, childbirth as turmoil, childbirth as judgment. He uses a bit of that, but then he draws this analogy into the rest of childbirth, which is not just the labor, it is the bringing forth of new life. And what he in essence says to his disciples is that all of this suffering you're about to experience, all of the turmoil you're about to experience, all the grief you're about to experience is going to hurt, but it will pale in comparison to the joy that comes after it because what you are experiencing is not the suffering of death, it's the suffering of birth. And what you are experiencing is the suffering necessary to bring about something new into the world. It is the same image that Paul uses just a few books later in Romans when Paul is talking about what Christ accomplished on the cross and this idea that Christ's work on the cross defeated those old curses of Eden, um, which, is, which is interesting to me that Jesus uses the image of childbirth right before the act of, of, of defeating that, those old Edenic curses, um, both the soil for the man and childbirth for the woman. Um, what Paul does is Paul then brings us the image that what Jesus was doing on the cross was defeating the darkness and the suffering and the death and the sin so that the new creation could come about. And what he actually uses, he uses imagery. Uh, all creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And we who have the first fruits of the spirit groan inwardly as we await our redemption and our sonship and the redemption of our bodies. And what he is in essence saying is that all of what Jesus came to bring about is the birth of something that we call the new creation, the new world. And it happened because of Jesus' suffering on the cross, which was not in a cosmic scheme of things the suffering of death, it was the suffering of birth. It was the suffering that would then give birth to this new creation. And what Paul and Jesus are both saying is that that suffering is something that is then shared by all of those who would follow Jesus into the new creation because Jesus' invitation is to pick up my cross and to follow him and through my cross and my faithfulness and his faithfulness, be a part of his bringing forth the new creation in my life. So fundamentally, the question that they put before us is this. What if, in some cosmic sense, the suffering we experience as children of God in this world is not the suffering of death, but the suffering of birth. What if the pain and the grief and the hardship and the darkness and the cross we find ourselves bearing at times during this lifetime is not suffering meant to kill us, but suffering meant to bring something new and good and whole into our world and into the world as a whole. And when I thought of it that way, stories kept coming to my mind. I remember the story of a good friend who told me once 
about the time that her husband had to enter a detox facility for an alcohol abuse problem. And she looked at me and she said, without sarcasm and without exaggeration, Meredith, we were in hell. He was in hell. I was in hell. It was the hardest thing we have ever done in our entire lives. But the hell of that time of their lives gave birth to a man who was no longer a slave to alcohol. And a man who more closely looked like the husband and father and human being, not only that he wanted to be, but that God had intended for him to be. Brought to mind um, a man who had told me about the fact when he finally made the decision to go into counseling, uh, he said he'd put off counseling for many, many years because it was easier just to keep on going with life than to deal with all of the stuff inside of him. And what he, what he told me, what he, what he said was it wasn't until he recognized that he had started behaving toward his son the way his abusive father behaved toward him that something clicked in him. And he had a heart-to-heart -heart with his wife, and he started this, this process of actually dealing with his demons. And for those of you who've been through that kind of counseling, there's counseling that feels good, and there's counseling that doesn't feel good. There's counseling that feels more like chemotherapy. This was the second kind. And he, he dealt with that, and he worked through it, and it got worse before it got better. But the man that emerged on the other side of that was a man who was the father that he wanted to be and the husband he wanted to be, and the person God had designed him to become. It reminded me, so, uh, it reminded me of a story of a woman who told me that she, uh, she stayed in what she knew was a toxic relationship for many years because it was easier to stay than to leave, and when she finally did leave, it plunged her into a depression for a year or more and at the time, she didn't think she was going to make it through. At the time, she didn't think that she was going to get through that season. And on the other side of it, what she saw was that season had turned her into a person who was ready, who was fit for the healthy, wonderful marriage that she is now in. What these images of the New Testament suggest to us, what if, in a cosmic sense, the suffering and the darkness and the wrestling and the grief in which we find ourselves in this lifetime are meant through the faithfulness of God to give birth within us and around us to a glimpse of the new creation, to a glimpse of the people God wants us to become to a glimpse of the world God is trying to create. Now this morning, obviously, is Mother's Day in our culture, and it's Mother's Day in our churches, and Mother's Day is one of those days that was started with the absolute best of intentions. It was originally to honor actually both fathers and mothers, and then they divided it up, and that's a whole another story. What it has become, though, is something that is not always observed well. Because there's a tendency in churches on a day like Mother's Day to sentimentalize motherhood. There is a tendency in churches to alienate and ostracize anyone who doesn't fit into the perfect woman box or the perfect mother box or um, perfect person with 2.5 kids box. I've had so many women, so, so many women tell me they will go to church every single day of the year except for Mother's Day, because Mother's Day is the only day of the year they don't feel normal. And I sympathize. I was, uh, I didn't get married until my 30s, and there were many years. The only reason I fit in at church on Mother's Day was because I was the pastor, and they were required to listen to me. <laughs> What Mother's Day has become, unfortunately, can tend toward 
alienating people who do not fit into a small ideal of biological motherhood. And I think that's a shame because I think Mother's Day fundamentally is something good to celebrate. And I think it's something to celebrate in churches if we understand it correctly. Because what we see in the scripture is that what we're talking about when we talk about motherhood is something far, far more expansive than biological motherhood. When we talk about motherhood of the scriptures, we are talking about the spiritual willingness to suffer in order to give birth to something new in the world. We are talking about the spiritual willingness to walk into a cross carrying season with the faith that God will bring something new out of it and grow it into nothing less than the kingdom of God. And that willingness and that faithfulness and that discipline is something that is not only worth celebrating, it is something that we should honor anywhere we see it and everywhere we see it. And you know what? I have just described a whole lot of biological mothers out there. I have just described a whole lot of mothers who have spent so much of their life doing so many loads of laundry that are never going to get thanked for them. But I have also described a whole lot of spiritual mothers who have never birthed children from their body, but have made the decision to nurture and to love children who are not biologically theirs, because of the love that was given to them in Christ and because of the faith of what Christ can do in bringing about newness out of brokenness. And you know what? I have also just described a lot of people who through their suffering and through their blood, sweat, and tears are working in ministries to bring about new life where there is death. I'm thinking about the people who are pouring themselves out in all of those um, restoration ministries, helping people walk this road of drug and alcohol recovery. I'm thinking about all of the people who are pouring themselves out um, in ministries, uh, feeding ministries, helping people learn how to grow their food and uh, take care of themselves and take care of the earth. I'm thinking about all of the people who have given themselves uh, to educational ministries and mentoring and loving children who are not biologically theirs. I'm thinking about the number of my friends who have committed themselves to foster parenting, that their call is not to have biological children of their own. Their call is to love as much as they can these children who are in this in-between time and at danger of being lost in the system. I am thinking of all of those people, and I'm thinking that that is the gift of spiritual motherhood, which Jesus talks about, which we should be celebrating today. And the gift of those, all of that, is, is, is Jesus' words. For a time you will have suffering, but you will see me again, and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. And everyone I've just described knows the truth that all of that work, all of the mothering work, whether it's biological mothering or spiritual mothering, is this crazy mixture of suffering and of joy. I am not going to stand before you today and sentimentalize motherhood whether we are talking the biological or the spiritual kind, because any of you who have experienced any part of it knows that there is very little sentimental about it. It is a crazy mix of suffering and of joy, and the suffering does not end with the labor pains. <laughs> the work of mothering something, the work of nurturing something, of bringing something from birth into the, the, the fullness of the new creation, is something that takes blood, sweat, and tears, and something that will break your heart a thousand times. And this side of eternity, the experience of mothering something is always going to be experience that is deeply interwoven with suffering and with joy, and almost impossible to tear those two apart. But, but, the word of the Lord this Mother's Day for all of our biological and spiritual mothers out there this morning is this. 
Jesus was not lying in John 16. Now you suffer, but in a little while you will see me, and you will rejoice. And nobody, nobody, nobody will take away your joy. Friends, that is why we celebrate Mother's Day. Because all of you at work, in the bringing new things forth and being mother and midwife to the pieces of new creation that God is bringing forth all around us, are engaged in holy work. And there are times that you will lose heart. And there are times that you will think it is not worth the effort. And there are times that you will think that the newness will never come to fruition. And there are times that you will think that all of your effort has been for naught. The faith of Christianity, the words of Christ, the message of the Lord, is that all of our suffering now is but the worst part of a labor pain because God has already won the ending for us and the end is good and the new creation will come to fruition and our parts in it, however small, will not be lost in the kingdom of God. And so don't lose heart, and don't give up. Do not think your work unimportant. Do not think it insignificant. Trust in Jesus, because he's not lying. And these days you suffer, and in these days you grieve. But the day is coming when you will rejoice. And nobody will take away your joy. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy
Friends, this is the point in our service where we offer ourselves back to the God who gave all of himself for us. And I want to invite you to make a sanctuary of where you are and spend the next two minutes between you and God in your heart of hearts and in your soul of souls responding to the call that has been placed within you. God asks nothing less than all of you. Your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness. And though the world looks different right now, it is more of a time for us to fulfill that call than ever before. And so between you and God, use this time now to offer yourself back to the God who gave all of himself to you. Would you join me as we pray a blessing upon all that we offer to God now? Almighty God, you have entrusted us with all that we call ours. You have given us our health and our bodies. You have given us our talents and our time. You have given us our families, our relationships. You have given us our material goods. You have given us all the opportunities that lie in front of us. And you have entrusted us with a spirit capable of following you in the way you set before us. And you gave us, most of all, the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ that is capable of redeeming us from our worst selves and transforming us into mothers and midwives of your new creation. And so, Heavenly Father, receive back from us, all of us, all of our time, all of our talents, all of our gifts, all of our service, all of our witness. Receive back all of our hesitations and all of our doubts. Receive back all that we have been keeping from you and use us to bring forth your new creation and your kingdom in this world. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Barnes a few announcements before we end our time of worship together. Uh, first of all, we are watching the Houston um, situation and we are listening to the advice of medical leaders and community leaders. We are working on a plan of reopening, but it is probably not going to be immediate. Uh, the campus is going to be closed throughout May and then we, we, depending on the advice we get from the medical community, we'll be looking at a staggered reopening after that, hopefully bringing people back together in some form. But I also want to say, I know and you know that there are people listening to this who are in the highest risk category who really need to not come back even after we open our doors. And for you, we are still going to be here. We're going to be online. We're going to be still doing our virtual Bible studies. We are going to keep as many resources as possible in place to stay connected with people who responsibly really should not come back even when we can. Um, for those of you who, who can come back, keep your, keep your ear to the ground, listen to that. We'll be set, getting out plans as we get them. For those of you who can't, we will not forget you. You are a part of our community. You are part of the body of Christ, and we want to stay connected with you as long as uh, this pandemic lasts. Um, for all of, all of us right now, uh, we have a number of Bible study options. If you've not connected with them, you should find uh, information about them on our website, wumc.com. There is a Bible study that meets this morning, 1030, immediately after this. There are Sunday school classes for kids that go out on our Facebook page every week. There are fantastic devotionals by our day school chaplain that come out. Um, utilize our resources to... Um, to, to stay connected to God and to, reach, to each other during this time because it's not going to last forever. Um, and just make sure, make sure that whatever happens during this time that you don't end up uh, finding yourself alone when you don't have to be because we are here for you and we want to maintain our community as much as we possibly can until we can all physically come back and gather together safely. My brothers and sisters, on this Mother's Day Sunday, I invite you, as your homework today, to find a time to say thank you to the spiritual mothers in your life. And for some of you, that is your biological mother, and do not forget her. Don't forget to send your text message or your call or your flowers or whatever you're going to do. But I will bet you it's more than your biological mother. I will bet you you have had people in your life who have called out the newness within you and have nurtured you into the person that you are meant to become. Don't forget those people either. This is not a time to be alone. This is the time to reach out and support one another and encourage one another and to say those words that we might never have said, thank you for what you've invested and what you've done in my life. Um, if you, we've got a shareable on our Facebook page if you wanna use it. You can also just reach out, send a phone call, send a text message. That is how we celebrate Mother's Day in the church. And now as we go out from this place, receive these words of blessing. The mission of Westminster is love God, make friends, and serve others. Go forth from this place in hope. Go forth in peace. Go forth in faith. Go forth in the knowledge that Jesus told the truth in John. Go forth in the knowledge that God is faithful in bringing to completion the work he has started. Go forth knowing that however much you may suffer now, the day will come when you will see Christ and you will rejoice. And no one and no one and no one will take away your joy. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.